Well, uh, let's uh, do a little bit of warm-up checking uh, in terms of what your previous exposure to, to our stuff is. Uh, who's actually working uh, with Spring, actively developing Spring applications? Okay, well, not unexpectedly, I guess. Inverse question, who's not currently working with Spring in, in practice? Is there anyone? Qu quite a few. Um, who hasn't ever looked at Spring before? Anyone dare to raise their hands? <laughs> no. Um, I'll do a little bit of a uh, 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 quick dive into modern day Spring initially. So uh, there, there will be um, a chance to, to find a, a common path of ours here this morning. Um, but the, the bulk of the session is on uh, a very recent efforts that we've been working on. So before we actually go into 5.0, I'll... Um, do a little bit of a uh, glance at photo three. Uh, so just to, um, uh, to give you the idea, we, um, we have a very um, uh, dynamic roadmap these days. We actually release uh, uh, feature releases every 10 months. We did photo two, photo one, photo two in very short succession for our purposes anyway. Uh, the, um, the feature release is what we call a feature release, like photo one and photo two or for the three now, actually very significant releases in their own right. They are basically major feature releases that other people would call 5.0, 6.0 and 7.0, I'm pretty sure, um, other open source projects in particular. We um, tend to use the major version number as a kind of baseline, which means as long as it's 4.3 here, we still hang on to the system requirements of the Spring Framework 4 generation. So even for the three, which has been released last Friday um, on, on the 10th, is a JDK 6 baseline version of the framework, of course, with very up-to-date JDK 8 support. Uh, as you're used to, we do not change system requirements in major, uh, um, uh, like in, in minor feature releases within the major generation. 5.0 is the chance to do this. We'll get to that in just a bit. Um, well, actually, while we, while we were doing some hand raising. Who's working with uh, Spring 4.2, Spring Framework 4.2? Boot 1.3. Okay, 4.1, anyone? Um, still stuck on 3.2 or using 3.2 for some reason? Okay, that's cool. That's basically um, where we are at. Um, most of the, um, most of the efforts, of course, these days go into the Spring Framework 4 line. Uh, 3.2 is just being maintained until the end of this year, but literally just maintained. 4.3 is a kind of wrap-up, the last feature release in our 4.x line. There's not going to be a 4.4 ever. 4.3 will have a, a kind of extended maintenance life until roughly 2019, maybe into 2020, similar to where 3.2 is right now. 3.2.x has an extended maintenance phase for almost four years now. Um, 4.3 is going to be the same kind of um, end of a generation, basically, of the framework. The um, um, range of supported platforms is, as mentioned, it's still uh, very conservatively baselined. JDK 6 plus and Servlet 2.5 plus. That translates as examples, for example, that it still runs on Tomkit 6. Um, it actually, much preferably, also runs on Tomcat 8.5, which was released just a couple of weeks ago. So this is kind of uh, the way we're going about this. Uh, baseline just means if you really want to, you can still run it there on this minimum baseline. We recommend the current generation of the infrastructure out there, and that would be Tomcat 8.5 in uh, the Tomcat line. In, in WebSphere, just as a common reference, you can still run it on WebSphere 7. Um, we do um, spend quite a bit of effort to make it work properly, uh, everything work properly on WebSphere 8.5, Liberty in particular, and we're working towards compatibility with 9. Nothing earth-shattering, we just do our share in terms of compatibility testing, that's all really. The uh, 4.3 generation, um, oh, the 4.3 opportunity, 
allowed us to do some refinements in the programming model. So 4.3 is actually somewhat significant in some of the things that it does. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the things. Because I guess you would actually expect those things to happen in a 5.0. Um, we intentionally brought some of those things forward to 4.3 because they are easily implementable on JDK 6 entire. So we can bring them to a wider range of system environments and we can bring them to you right now, as opposed to next year. So that's why we took some things that we would otherwise only really do in the 5.0 and brought them forward to 4.3. Some of them appear minor, but actually somewhat significant. If you look at this kind of component class, it doesn't look out of the ordinary, but the commented out part at the constructor is intentional. As of 4.3, you do not have to mark a constructor as auto-wired, as at auto-wired, if it is the only constructor anyway in an annotated class, in an annotated setup. So we kind of still recommend to do it for the source code readability part. If you look at your piece of source code, the at auto-wired still tells you something about this constructor, that it is an auto-wired constructor. But technically, you do not have to annotate a single constructor scenario anymore. We imply the at auto wide for you. This is something we considered for quite a while and has been raised to us. It's actually feedback driven, so uh, quite a few people raised it to us. Um, this scenario, I would actually personally opt for annotating it because it's consistent with the style of the rest of the class. But consider a class that doesn't have any annotations otherwise. It's maybe it's registered uh, by type or it's created by, um, through some other means, not through uh, detection in the class path based on stereotype annotations. Uh, maybe it doesn't have transaction annotations at all. It could not have any annotations otherwise. It would just have this at auto wide for the constructor, for dependency injection purposes. Then it becomes more compelling to just skip the at auto wired, have a non-annotated class automatically managed by the framework um, in a reasonable way. So this is the, an example for the sort of refinement. You can even do this to configuration classes these days. This might also look like somewhat uh, common or obvious, but it is actually not. Configuration classes used to not support constructor injection. Because for an at configuration stereotype, we actually create subclasses through the glib, and previously, we did not generate uh, equivalent constructors on that subclass. You simply could not declare non-default constructors in a configuration class. So people resorted to like field injection for common types that they wanted to link into their, their factory methods here, like this book at min data source. We don't like field injection all that much, or at least some of us don't. So um, we prefer to give you the opportunity to, uh, to, to give you the uh, chance, the ability to use constructor injection wherever you would otherwise use field injection. We close that gap in folder three now. So just do the obvious, Declare a constructor like in any other component class, make it accept the references, store them in a the field. You can basically do in a configuration class what you would do in any other Spring component class as well now. That was a goal in the design of configuration classes anyway, <coughs> that they are regular component classes with a special role, but you can basically do whatever you can do in, in component classes. This was a gap that we only really closed in for the three now. And combined with the previous little feature, you don't even have to annotate it with that auto wide if it is the only constructor. But you obviously can, right? So it, again, if you see a commented out annotation here, this means can be annotated for readability purposes, doesn't have to because it is the default on my slides here. Right, um, another example. There are actually many such refinements. There's a uh, collection and map injection has been refined. Uh, self injection has been refined. There are quite a few things that have been refined in the dependency injection space. But this is not a photo three presentation, so I'm just giving you two major um, examples. The other one here is a, uh, a controller class, an annotated controller. This one doesn't look doesn't look uh, strange to you, I guess. I mean, maybe except for the cross-origin part, dates back to the core support in Folder 2. But other than that, this is actually pretty straightforward. It is RESTful or REST-oriented anyway. Uh, it tries to bind to a particular path, to particular paths, and uses HTTP method bindings. Now, a refinement that we chose to do in Folder 3, finally, 
is to provide pre-composed annotations for some of our mappings. Uh, you might generally be aware that uh, Spring 4, Spring 4.2 and higher in particular, has a very strong composable annotation story. You can build your own annotations for almost anything. In 4.2, we really uh, completed the feature set in terms of what you can compose, how you can refer to other attributes, that sort of stuff. In Folder 3, we chose to include some pre-composed annotations for you. Not shown here, um, for example, finally we have request scope, session scope, and application scope annotations, just in case you really need them that way. Uh, this is not magic, this is not even uh, directly supported in the framework. It is literally a just pre-composed annotation, meta-annotated with a standard annotation, shipped in, the co in our core jars, that's all. You could build them on your own at any point. Now, for request mappings, a common complaint is that the uh, annotation mapping style is a little bit wordy if you map to more than one attribute, like to a path and a method. So if you're, if you're mapping, uh, if your constraints are um, a, a little bit more complex than just a single element, it starts becoming a little <coughs> not as readable as it should be. In particular, since in the Java annotation model, once you specify more than one attribute, uh, as an annotation designer, we can only select one attribute that you can implicitly set without saying value equals, just provide the value. But if you specify more than one attribute, as a user here, you always have to name the attributes, path equals this, method equals that. So, as an example for what composable annotations can do in general, and what we chose to do out of the box in Folder 3, we provide pre-composed annotations for the typical REST-oriented mapping scenarios. Get mapping and post mapping are literally just convenience classes, convenience annotations, meta annotated with add request mapping, but designed in such a way that you typically only specify one attribute, which makes it significantly shorter because there's no attribute name equals in here. The HTTP method is implied by the, by the annotation name which also makes it, well, makes it more readable and saves the second attribute. Um, there's a little bit of a connection to another foot of three refinement. We have um, a set of mapping annotations here, like get, uh, post, patch, put, and delete. We do not do options and head mapping because we refined our default options and head behavior. We aligned it with what HTTP servlet typically does. Um, so if you run a foot of three application against such mappings, you will find that the um, dispatcher server is a little bit smarter in finding out what it should return when an options request comes in. It actually looks at your mappings, figures out what mappings, uh, what mappings there are for particular HTTP methods against your given path and will return a corresponding options response. Um, we have a, a quite a few refinements in that space. We are generally very HTTP oriented these days. We try to do things the HTTP way in quite a few ways, including HTTP caching uh, you know, and uh, just the general interaction with HTTP means. Uh, this is also one example where those things actually add up quite nicely. All right, and if you, if you directly compare it, it is significantly more concise in the end. So who, who likes the get mapping, post mapping style, the shorter one? Okay, good to see, thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, by the way, uh, the expressiveness, of course, is basically ex the same, right? It is a request mapping annotation just in a different wrap. Um, there's always request mapping to fall back to. All right, let's move on. Um, so th those were examples for four to three features. Those are already out there. We released them last week. And uh, we have a 431 coming up uh, in, in uh, like July 1st at the moment. So uh, we are already basically in the GA phase. Um, this can be used right now in this production supported to, to this day already. Now, let's switch gears a little. We um, look into early 2017. We are preparing for a 5.0 generation for quite a while already. So we started talking about it last year. Uh, we knew that we wanted to um, have a JDK 8 baseline version of the framework. That was actually one of the initial intentions. Um, so for, for the two, for the three, we decided to do it for the three still. That's, that's all cool and delivers a lot of value. Runs great on JDK 8 in particular, 
but as mentioned, it's still JDK 6 baseline, which means um, there's some, there are some things we cannot do within the framework because we have to uh, restrict ourselves to uh, JDK, the JDK 6 API level um, and the JDK 6 language level. Um, th the funny part is you probably won't notice that much. If you run Spring Photo 3 on JDK 8, it just feels like a JDK 8 based framework to you. It does everything it possibly can. It understands Java Util Stream, it uh, uh, automatically adapts to Java Util Optional, um, Lambdas perfectly work, um, a parameter name discovery on JDK 8 works, a everything you could typically expect as an application developer works for you because the framework auto adapts if it encounters JDK 8 code at runtime. If it encounters the use of JDK 8 API in your classes, the framework automatically adapts and supports it. That's cool, that's what we wanted to achieve in the Spring Framework 4 line, um, but it doesn't change the fact that internally we would also benefit quite a bit from being JDK 8 Plus within our own code base. So we are the JDK 8 Plus part is primarily for us, admittedly. But it's also a, a, a kind of measure that we take for further evolution afterwards. We allow ourselves then to use JDK 8 API types in our signatures. We can refer to the Java Util function interfaces. We can do uh, quite a few things we are just unable to do in uh, statically declared signatures right now. However, the JDK 8 baselining is more, more for us. Right? In terms of uh, feature themes for Spring Framework 5, we aim for a reasonably comprehensive JDK 9 story. I'll elaborate on that a bit. We have a strong focus on HTTP 2. That was part of the initial mission. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we're going about this. And we have a strong focus for a reactive programming story, a reactive programming model within the core Spring Framework style, within the core Spring Framework distribution, from the ground up, uh, integrated into the core framework, but of course also um, to shine through uh, in other parts of our portfolio. So we are talking about a generation of the framework that targets 2017 plus. Uh, we design it for the infrastructure and the challenges of 2017 and higher. So the baseline upgrade is actually um, quite a bit more than just the JDK 8 plus baseline. We raise uh, quite a few of them, um, not too aggressively. I mean, notice the server 3.0 plus part, right? It's not even server 3.1 plus. Um, but we require a few reasonably recent um, API generations here. Basically, Java E7 level with a few compromises like the server 3.0 um, and higher part. We will also raise the baseline for third party libraries. At this point um, in 4.3, we are still pretty generous in terms of uh, letting you choose the version of, say, Hibernate and uh, Jackson um, and all the common libraries typically combined with Spring. It's your choice, after all. We, just, we support the version range. It was always like that. In um, Spring 5, we're going to use the opportunity to raise that baseline as well. It's going to be not too aggressive, but in particular with Hibernate, uh, to tell a very current story, very uh, hot story from, from um, just a couple of days ago. In particular with Hibernate, we are not really in the business of supporting versions of Hibernate that the Hibernate team itself doesn't support anymore. And uh, you might be aware that Hibernate, um, well, Hibernate 3.6, which we still support in deprecated form right now, uh, is basically long gone from the Hibernate team's perspective, but they don't even support uh, Photo 3 anymore. They just support the latest uh, um, Hibernate 5 generations. So if you raise a bug with Hibernate, you're going to get a fix in 5.2.x. If you really strongly push, you might get it in 5.1.x still, but that's about it. Um, so we have to adapt to that. There's nothing we can do um, other than being a little generous in how long we carry existing code around. As of Spring 5, it's going, it's going to be Hibernate 5 Plus, in all likelihood even Hibernate 5 to 2 Plus that we require. We have to align with what uh, those guys do. But that's not set in stone yet. So the baseline upgrade actually goes across the framework, including third-party libraries. I've mentioned the infrastructure themes already. We'll just have a little bit of a more extensive discussion one by one here. So what about JDK 9? Um, JDK 9 is um, 
something we, that we track for, um, for about a year now, in the meantime. We, may, uh, we are started making sure that even Spring Framework for the two builds ran on JDK 9. For the three, for a long time, the build would just run, uh, the tests would pass on JDK 9. Uh, the problem with JDK 9, of course, is it's a moving target. Um, every time they merge a the significant uh, change in, like, and they significantly rearrange the JDK itself, every time they do this, the build breaks, right? So at the moment, uh, we don't actually actively uh, test against JDK 9. We will pick this up again for Spring Framework 5, since uh, uh, JDK 9 intends to go GA next year. Um, intense, right? March 2017 is the target that they set. Um, that target actually um, implies a feature freeze uh, about two or three weeks ago, which did not happen. And it's been declared that there is no feature freeze yet. They're still actively looking for feedback. They haven't got a new feature freeze deadline. My expectation is that JDK9 will not ship on time uh, on that basis. And there is a history for this. I mean, you can just extrapolate uh, how, um, how they handled it with JDK8. We are actually in touch with a few of those people, but uh, you just don't get a hard date from those guys or any kind of hard statements. So uh, we can only make assumptions. My assumption is that JDK9 will be delayed, uh, a bit at least. We nevertheless focus on JDK9 because we uh, believe that as, a, as an industry, as an ecosystem, as a community here, we have to embrace the latest core technologies that we, we have in, in, in this industry, right? In our technology stack. If JDK9 goes out, we have to embrace it. There's no way the Java industry is going to move forward with uh, um, for, uh, forever being stuck on JDK 8. JDK 9 actually has uh, a lot of stuff in it that's not being talked about much. In particular, JVM improvements. I mean, technically, even I'm not talking about it on the slides, uh, because everybody always talks about Jigsaw, and I will say a little, uh, just a few words on Jigsaw in a bit. But JDK 9 has much more to offer. JDK 9 has uh, compact strings. JDK 9 has significant improvements to the G1 garbage collector. Um, it has significant improvements to the startup time of smaller applications. So, uh, and the mem uh, in particular, significant improvements to the memory profile overall of a running application. So even if you do not care about any API, any language enhancement, of which there are none anyway, in JDK 9, then just basically forget about that and upgrade to JDK 9 just for the JVM, just for the JVM improvements. There are a few APIs in there uh, that are noteworthy. Uh, they ship an ALPN stack now, needed for HTTP 2. Uh, really overdue that it's kind of available out of the box without uh, hacking your JDK or without uh, having to modify your JDK installation. Uh, HTTP 2 is something to be covered in just a bit anyway, so uh, um, let's keep this brief. There is a new HTTP client, a kind of uh, successor of the good old URL connection. You know, in, in the JDK, we have this nice little strange API, uh, java.net URL connection, dates back to 1996, I think. Um, so it kind of has its 20th anniversary um, now. but it's just a an, an completely outdated API, and not particularly HTTP-focused either. It was meant to cover different protocols, FTP and so forth, right? Um, so there is a new client effort. Uh, I've had a look at it. I'm not super convinced. Uh, it's that great a step forward, really. Uh, I would probably rather keep using one of the um, uh, more comprehensive HTTP libraries out there like uh, uh, the OK, OK HTTP client or uh, uh, e even Apache HTTP client uh, are all significantly um, more powerful and customizable than, than this effort. But at least there is a new HTTP client. So there some things are happening that kind of really matter to, um, to what we are doing these days, to building modern, efficient web applications. And then there's Jigsaw. So uh, with Jigsaw, we initially had a story that I'm just going to show you an impression of what it uh, is supposed to look like, where we thought that's actually a fine fit. We have a decomposed framework. Uh, the framework consists of quite a few modules with well-defined dependencies, some of them required, some of them optional. Jigsaw initially was designed as a way to formally declare some of those structural uh, metadata 
in your jar files. And the idea is actually, is to this day, is, is, is sound. The problem is that the uh, direction that Jigsaw is going in terms of its focus is, um, from my perspective, not ideal. Um, but the idea is an alternative to the class path. Instead of saying, bootstrap my JVM, here's this really long list of jar files that I'm going to concatenate into a single class path string. Instead of that, you point to symbolic module names. And the modules internally declare required dependencies on each other. So they can, can bring each other in implicitly. A fine idea. Unfortunately, it's not uncharted territory, right? We've, um, uh, we've had OSGI before. We had other module system attempts, uh, for example, in JBoss land before. The, um, the space is unfortunately pretty complex. Module systems, um, if you just look at the 80% case, they always look straightforward and easy. The moment that you try to model real-life scenarios and you get closer to the 100% uh, target, uh, they become super complex. That's exactly what Jigsaw is right now. The 80% case worked a year ago, or oh, nine months ago. But they're, they're struggling with the remaining 20%, and they've been struggling quite a bit. Might be the main reason why JDK9 is delayed. Okay, so back to our vision. The idea is pretty simple. That that's basically Jigsaw um, syntax, a module declaration in a module-info file. The idea is that it's basically the package-info.java idea, just uh, in a module-info, where the compiler actually compiles this thing into a, a binary representation, and the JVM can introspect uh, structural information a fine idea, definitely more efficient on startup than uh, trying to parse manifest entries, and uh, like OSGI does. However, um, it's of course a kind of new language, right? You, you specify dependencies, you, you can export certain packages, you have a symbolic namespace of modules, right? Those are actually symbolic names. Java.sql is a JDK defined name. We could take our Spring JDBC jar from the Maven Central hosted uh, Spring JDBC jar, wrap it up like this, uh, give it a symbolic name Spring that, uh, dot JDBC along the same lines, and make it usable in the same way. Wouldn't that be nice? Unfortunately, it's technically not feasible at this point, because um, our modules have a lot of optional dependencies. Um, as you certainly are aware, uh, a Spring's web module, for example, or a Spring's JDBC module, uh, and others optionally support several binding libraries, several connection pools. If you choose to use, for example, Jackson, then uh, your Spring web module has the Jackson support inside. If you don't use Jackson, just ignore those few classes in the Spring web module. Such a scenario cannot be modeled in Jigsaw at this point, because Jigsaw does not have optional dependencies. If you compile against something, Jigsaw insists on that something being present at runtime. So if we compile our Spring Web module against the optional Jackson support, or the Spring JDBC module against, uh, say, the optional um, uh, connection pools that we compile against, then all of those compilation dependencies are being enforced at runtime. This is exactly what we do not want. Right? A module system that, in that brings unwanted dependencies onto the runtime class path? I mean, come on, that's uh, basically uh, the top failure for any module system attempt that you could possibly arrive at. Uh, a module system is supposed to have a, an, a representation of what you actually need at runtime. It's supposed to have a well-defined set of, uh, to bring a well-defined set of classes through modules onto your class path, not the other way around. So we have an issue here. It's um, well communicated. It's actually uh, pretty much at the top of the wish list on, on the Jigsaw Wiki. Has a lot of stakeholders, ourselves and quite a few others, that insist on optional dependencies being declarable in Jigsaw, in the sense of, I want it at compilation time. I do not insist on having it at runtime. I can deal with it if it's not present at runtime. Basically, a requires optional keyword, something like that. Literally with the semantics of, at runtime, if you can't find it, just proceed and let me run into my no cluster found error, please. Um, that's basically what we want from Jigsaw. A pretty straightforward uh, a feature, you would think, but it's at the top of the wish list for half a year now. Not dealt with. And we have no idea what we can or should be doing 
um, to make it happen. Um, it's really up to the Jigsaw team to decide whether and when it will make it in. So at this point, this is an idea, a vision, a sketch. We would like to make that happen on Jigsaw. If uh, things remain the way they are right now, we cannot make it happen. Um, so we're going to recommend JDK9 nevertheless for the JVM improvements. And basically, please keep using the class path mode. It works fine on JDK9. There's nothing wrong with it. And Boot has a great auto configuration experience with the class path mode. So um, uh, we don't depend on this really. But it would nevertheless be nice to have a story in this space, wouldn't it? OK, let's move beyond Jigsaw to something that actually matters. <coughs> um, HTTP2. I have already hinted at it. I personally strongly believe we need to embrace such industry efforts. We need to embrace not only JDK9, um, we need even more need to be focused on industry-wide standards beyond the Java ecosystem. And there's nothing more important than HTTP2 to be dealt with here. If within the Java space we, we, we wouldn't get our act together here, uh, we would really um, look a little bit dated compared to almost any other programming environment out there. If you look at the state of HTTP2, the browsers, they did their job, right? Chrome, uh, well, even, even, even Edge and uh, uh, Firefox and Safari, they basically in the meantime, they all did their job. Quite a, few, uh, quite a bit of the server infrastructure is basically already capable of um, handling HTTP2. But in Java land, the server containers, well, there are good news, and we'll, we'll get to that uh, in, in, in just a bit. Uh, but there, is no strong, there are no strong forces um, pushing towards HTTP2 in the Java space, really. It's efforts by um, selected stakeholders, not necessarily by the ecosystem overall. So we won't really get into why HTTP2 matters, but I've just listed a few of the things that are really, really worth having. I mean. Efficient binary representation, uh, symbolic references to the same headers instead of redeclaring the same headers for every single request. I mean, there are uh, a few th of those things. I mean, connection multiplexing in general, a few of those things that really, really matter. Uh, we can optimize whatever we want uh, within our server system. If the system keeps talking the 20 year old HTTP 1.1 to its clients, it's kind of in vain. All right, so much for a little bit of an HTTP 2 pitch. Um, so what's the story in Java land? There is an ongoing effort for quite a while already to enforce HTTP2 support through Servlet 4.0. The Servlet 4.0 revision of the spec um, actually literally enforces HTTP2 support in its implementations. The problem is that the spec is stuck in uh, a proposed, or a, like an early draft basically, just a, a very early proposal from last October, hasn't been updated in about eight months, no work going on on the expert group, it's basically in a very unclear state, like uh, most of Java E8, like most of the Java E8 uh, associated specs. But for Serverless for the Dough, that's really a shame. It really is a shame because the focus of Serverless for the Dough itself is sound. It doesn't really try to accomplish too many things. It focuses on one thing it tries to do it well, which is HTTP2 support within the Serverless world. So, please, could we make that actually happen? Could we have that right now? No. Uh, at the moment, the uh, target date is mid-2017, mid-next year. On the assumption that we are already uh, in public final draft, which we are far from. In other words, mid-2017 is not going to happen from where it is right now, unless something dramatic uh, happens in terms of somebody really picks it up and makes it happen within uh, a few months. Uh, I don't see that push. Our reaction to this is we try to make it happen. We have people on the Servlet for the Doe spec. We kind try to do a little bit of lobbying. We care about Tomcat 9. Tomcat 9 is Servlet 4 focused. We really want Tomcat 9 to happen, to go GA um, at some point. But in the meantime, and that meantime can actually last for quite a while still. In the meantime, we focus on the uh, native efforts in the containers which hap ha happen to have an HTTP2 story. In particular, Tomcat 8.5, recently released, which is kind of a backport of the HTTP2 stuff from the Tomcat 9 line, but working against the server 3.1 container that is Tomcat 8. So Tomcat 8.5 is a fine effort in this space. JD 9.3 actually led 
the pack it was one of the first to roll HTTP2 support into a current generation server container. And Undertow 1.3, 1.4, uh, mo moving to 1.4 now, those containers did their job and they are really worth embracing. If you're on Tomcat, if you're on Jetty, um, and by all means upgrade. Use, use a HTTP2 enabled version of your container. Um, of course, in a, you, know, you need to make sure your entire infrastructure actually is able to deal with HTTP2, uh, but HTTP2 is a fine arrangement, right? You can, if something does not work, it implicitly downgrades to HTTP 1.1. Uh, you're not taking anything away from anybody. You just make it significantly more efficient for modern day HTTP clients to talk to your service. So, for our Spring Framework 5 purposes, um, we have a strong HTTP2 focus in the sense of we want this to make it into production environments as soon as possible, right now basically. So we even rolled uh, quite a bit of this into 4.3. In Spring Framework 4.3, uh, all of these modern day server containers are being supported. You can set them up with HTTP2, Spring works just fine. We are trying to, to have an equivalent story for Spring Boot, uh, where those containers are really the recommended versions with their HTTP2 support. For Spring 5, we're going to continue along those lines, of course. So new revisions of those containers or other containers having native HTTP2 stories, we will pick them up and do whatever we can to uh, allow the use of HTTP2 through the Spring um, web application model. Um, but it's not really dedicated HTTP2 support. We can't really go beyond the server 3.1 API in the server MVC stack. So server 4.0, we still would like to see it happen rather soon. Uh, I at least hope that there's going to be a revision, a kind of uh, public final draft by early next year, which we would pick up and support the latest Tomcat 9 milestone at least against it. So we're going to do our share. We're going to have early server for the door support in some form uh, in Spring 5 for sure, unless it gets dropped completely, which uh, is hopefully not the case. Um, and not in our control, right? We can just pick up whatever Oracle allows to happen in the servlet 4 space. All right, um, so let's switch gears again to just a little bit of a uh, discussion about our reactive model. Now, the we've been talking about the servlets and servlet 4. Um, this is primarily relevant from a Spring perspective for what we call Spring MVC. It's actually more like Spring servlet MVC. Spring MVC is a servlet-based web application framework, always was, still is, tries to maximize um, basically your, your ability to, to interact and integrate with a servlet-based environment. And this will stay the same in Spring 5. Spring 5 will have Spring Servlet MVC in an updated form, that's basically what we've been discussing, Servlet 4 capable ideally, uh, but still essentially servlet based, servlet integrated, uh, a good citizen in integration with other servlet based libraries and frameworks out there. In parallel to that, we have a strong focus on a reactive programming model, trying to rethink what a modern day web stack needs to look like, in particular if you would like to optimize it towards the most efficient use of your resources. The most, uh, basically, a server container, uh, I guess most of you are aware, is not really particularly efficient in its use of threatening resources. You get a, um, a threat from a threat pool, it's assigned to you, you process your request, you do everything you need to do within that thread, and you just hold on to that thread, you don't let it go. You write the response, you actually keep writing the response until you're done, even if it's a couple of hundred megabytes, and then you let go. There are ways to optimize this a little. There's in server 3.0, 3.1, there were some ways where you could spin off long running um, threads to a, another worker thread pool. There are ways to go around it. We have actually support for it in Spring MVC, the deferred result model and some of those things. It, it certainly addresses some hotspot problems, but doesn't change the fundamental architecture. The architecture is not, there's nothing wrong with the architecture. <coughs> the architecture just implies um, certain compromises that you have, th that you have to be willing to accept. And we have all learned to accept those in the servlet world. 
in the reactive world, we kind of turn the picture around. Uh, forget basically about server containers. What about a modern day web stack, a network stack that does HTTP endpoint processing on an engine such as Netty, the common choice for um, custom efficient network stacks out there? So if you run on Netty, you basically go back to a pre servlet world almost. You focus on the network stack itself. And the uh, programming model that has to go with it in order to actually allow you to expose the capabilities and the efficiency of this underlying network stack has to be reactive. It has to be callback driven. You react to incoming data when it's actually there. You react to the ability to write to the response when the network stack is actually able to send data to the response. You don't just uh, work with input streams and output streams. You work with um, reactive streams. And this little manifesto thing um, actually led to the uh, reactive streams initiative. Reactive streams is a specification. Well, is it? It's actually more like four types. It's a very small condensed uh, um, set of types modeling a particular um, part of the challenges of uh, reactive interaction between resources. It basically, literally, is a publisher type with a subscriber, a subscription model, and a back pressure arrangement, where publishers and subscribers can interact with each other. Kind of the uh, a publisher is not going to just uh, uh, send stuff uh, the other way without even worrying. It actually waits on a subscriber to require data from the publisher. Publishers and subscribers interact with each other when both are actually capable of doing their job um, in simple terms. Reactive Streams itself is not a user programming model. Reactive Streams is basically an infrastructural um, initiative where Network stacks, HTTP containers of some sort, uh, uh, data store drivers, and application frameworks can agree on basic types that they can pass along, that they uh, allow to interact. The real power of the model only shines through if you can interact reactively from your HTTP endpoint down to the data store and back up. That's why reactive streams is so important. The Reactive Streams initiative is so important. So Reactive Streams is basically a GitHub project and, uh, and a website uh, in Orkut Reactive Streams and has been embraced by all, all current stakeholders out there, um, or at least they all expressed an intent to embrace it. Um, Rx Java, for example, predates Reactive Streams, and Rx Java 2 is not kind of not actually getting there that quickly. Our own Reactor project is Reactive Streams based. So that's the, probably the reference example for what a reactive streams-based um, library and composition library in particular can do. And uh, uh, Aka Streams is al also reactive streams aligned. So there is some broad industry support uh, already. And it's even going to be repackaged into JDK 9. The uh, new Java util concurrent flow type in JDK 9 is the reactive streams API repackaged into subtypes of this uh, flow container type. But it literally is the same API, just in a different namespace. So the uh, reactive streams does not try to model composition libraries. So if you have any uh, impressions of RxJava already, RxJava basically is a very rich set of, uh, of operators. Um, it's basically a, a composition library, whereas reactive streams is just a minimal interaction specification. They are really very complementary. For a user programming model, these things matter much more than Reactive Streams itself. So it you would focus on the use of Reactor or RxJava, for example. So um, to give you an idea what this can look like, we are talking about something really pre-releasey here. This is a GitHub project, an R&D project of ours, called Spring Reactive. We're actually somewhat close to merging it into a, a Spring Framework 5.0 master branch. Uh, we intend to do that in late July, but at the moment you can look at the current state uh, on GitHub in the Spring Reactive project. The uh, idea is that we use a Spring MVC-like programming style, Spring MVC-oriented or uh, aligned um, controller model, but running on a reactive network stack, exposing the full power of 
the underlying reactive stack if you choose to use it. So we're not trying to abstract the stack between uh, uh, servlet MVC and, and, and the reactive model here. We're trying to provide common programming model elements, but you choose one stack or the other. Um, basically, you have to live with the compromises. You get all the benefits, but also all the limitations of the stack that you choose. Uh, typical spring style. We don't try to abstract and take things away. We, try, we rather try to align. So stylistically, in the sense of our, uh, the beginning where we talked about a couple of stylistic elements in Spring 3. Stylistically, a web controller on a reactive stack looks very much like a Spring MEC controller. Uses request mappings, uses uh, the controller stereotype, it's regular component classes managed by the Spring container. Request mapping, binding requests uh, to certain handler methods, but now look at the handler method signature. <coughs> the handler method signature does not accept a fully um, converted payload from the incoming request. It doesn't return a fully computed response either. It declares a type called flux coming from the Reactor project. If you have an RxJava background, think observable. So you actually get a hot stream, basically a, an access to the incoming data in not fully consumed form. And you can express operations or pass them on, of course, uh, against this incoming stream in a sense that allows the runtime to uh, call your, your operations back uh, as the data actually comes in and as it is actually consumable without blocking the thread, without waiting on any stream to uh, uh, give you further bytes of data. So you program in a way where you allow the runtime to call you back efficiently. You never block, you just have uh, small processing steps for pieces of data, chunks of data. The runtime uh, is then able to selectively call you back as the data is actually ready to process. So this style, for any, anyone having ever looked at RxJava, should look very familiar. You can literally switch Flux to Observable and it would look the same. Um, we intend to also support RxJava Observable, by the way. Um, so the intentions are in the current prototype and uh, uh, in all likelihood also going to be in Spring 5 proper. The real power, and this is a sketch, so this is not working code, right? Uh, in well, like, what, what's my repository? Um, this is more of a, a sketch that uh, where we're working towards. Um, the real power is in the interaction with the underlying data stores. If your processing architecture is reactive all the way through, if your repositories and the underlying data store drivers support reactive streams, ideally, you could make something like this happen. An, uh, an incoming hot stream of data being passed on to the underlying repository written to the target data store as the data comes in from the HTTP request and as the output, uh, as the data source actually able to store the, um, uh, the output. So reactive interaction at that level would maximize the effect that you get. Because the general questions behind this are more along the lines of what kind of benefit will our actually get in my environment, with my workload, uh, my system constraints. So this is basically what we're working towards. Uh, Spring Data, by the way, if you think repositories, Spring Data repositories, Spring Data uh, plans to have dedicated uh, reactive repository support very soon as well. So we are working at that, uh, on that at several levels here. It will also work with custom arrangements of yours. There's no need to have a, uh, a fully spring-based stack here. Reactive streams as a general industry initiative allows you to work with uh, other data store drivers that we are not even aware of. As long as they support reactive streams, you should be able to wire them up and have efficient processing gens um, without us having to do first-class support for it. That's the vision that we're working towards. And that's why not only we have to do our job, there are quite a few others working on efforts that directly connect to this. Um, reactive or at least non-blocking drivers for some of the data stores, for example, Couchbase. There's even one in the works for Postgres, although I never personally looked at it. The um, equally important parts are in the frameworks and the HTTP processing libraries. So um, a reactive server, a reactive HTTP server is great, but on the client side, in particular within a larger microservices arrangement where 
some services of yours are going to call other services of yours, we also need reactive HTTP clients, making very efficient use of uh, threads and uh, HTTP connections on the client side. And last but not least, we have a uh, joint initiative called Reactive Streams Commons, where quite a few industry stakeholders um, collaborate in terms of common code, for example, adapters to Server 3.1 Async IO, where our, our programming model, our reactive MVC-like MVC web endpoint model, can actually run on a server container, but not as server MVC. It's more like with the reactive streams version of this, uh, uh, this arrangement adapted, adapted to the underlying server 3.1 Async IO model. This is not as efficient as you th would hope it would be. We strongly recommend a proper reactive network stack, um, more towards the likes of Netty. Um, this becomes more interesting if Jetty and Tomcat actually pick up on reactive streams comments, uh, because there's an SPI in there that allows them to expose efficient reactive streams handles um, to us through the server 3.1 model. So this is still in the works. We're talking, all, talking about things that are basically all in planning stages or in the works here. Um, if this turns out uh, by early next year, we might actually have pr a pretty efficient reactive uh, web stack on Chatty or e and even on Tomcat uh, somewhat soon. We'll see. So we are, we are working with uh, uh, several, several stakeholders here, uh, trying to move this forward in time for early next year because Early next year is when we intend to go GA with this. Our goal is to have a release candidate towards the end of this year. A Spring Framework 5.0 RC1 towards the end of this year. A milestone one in late July, that's pretty much a given at this point, in time for our Spring 1 conference in Las Vegas this year. Uh, an RC1 towards the end of the year. And the GA date soon after as soon as possible, as you may figure, we depend on some other efforts. We really want things to work together properly. We don't want to go GA too early with this. It really needs to work uh, top to bottom as a sound overall arrangement. Um, so our target is roughly March 2017. That sounds like the JDK9 GA target, doesn't it? Uh, intentionally so. But if JDK9 is not going GA in March, we are probably nevertheless going to go GA with Spring 5 in March. Uh, we'll see. This is a little bit too far out for a hard promise. Uh, the uh, goal that we see as a kind of hard target at this point is an RC1 by the end of the year, and we'll take it from there. All right, so much for a little bit of insight into our work on Spring for Mac 5 and some of the thinking behind it. Um, thanks for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the day. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to have them here. Uh, we're running a little bit late, uh, but I think we have time for one or two questions that came in through the app. Uh, so let's do that. Oh, there's an app for that. Yeah, <laughs> there's an app for that, exactly. Uh, so one of the questions is, uh, when you were talking about embracing uh, new industry standards, um, why did Spring choose to have its own Spring MVC-based programming model for RESTful resources and such, rather than uh, using J JAXRS? Rather uh, than JAXRS? Um, um, well, the short version of this is, we primarily care for actual industry standards, in the sense of across language standards uh, um, within the Java ecosystem, um, we do not really have a lot of trust for the JCP to deliver. Uh, and if you look at the current state of Java E8, just Google for the state of Java E8, uh, if you haven't read the news, uh, then you know what, what I'm referring to here. We like to be in control of not only our vision, but also our ability to deliver on the vision. and um, with JAXRS and Spring MVC in particular, um, there's not enough time to discuss this, but there are quite a few design reasons why we chose to uh, have our own model. Um, we keep it reasonably aligned so that kind of your know-how doesn't have artificially break if you switch between them. Um, but um, I would argue our way of handling this in the sense of the ability to release when we are ready, when we intend to release, when we think it's needed in, uh, in production, and the ability to evolve it from there every year with new features and refinements at our pace, this is essential to the success of Spring. And uh, the JCP just doesn't cut it in that sense. A new version of a spec with an overloaded API method every four years is 
not my taste of evolving a, a programming model. Yeah. Uh, there are some other questions, but they are of a rather low-level technical nature. So um, I advise people to for more come intense up. questions. I'm here all day. I'm also here right now. So just let's just chat one on one. Okay. So thank you for attending. Please don't uh, forget to vote, and hopefully we'll see you at the uh, next session here on this track. Thank you.